Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. We're going to take a look at the brand spanking new just on the market Siglent SSA 3021X and click here if you haven't seen the uh, comparison of this against the Rigol uh, 815. So I've done a video on that. Let's crack it open. Now for those playing along at home, this is the new hardware, the latest one that has been uh, redesigned because they had a few issues uh, late last year, they had to redesign this thing, so this is the latest one, May 2016 build. Got a couple of screws on the top here and on the bottom, uh, just like the uh, Rigol unit, screwed in exactly the same way. Yeah. And we can make short work of this uh, security sticker with an anti-static bag here. I've done a separate video on that. Click here to check it out. And yes, they have a bit of thread locker on the screws. As is common, there's a couple of little clips there that you have to get off. And once we do that, well, let's crack it open. And ta-da! We're in like Flynn. There's our shielding. And yes, it's the exact same uh, sheet steel construction as we've seen in other Siglent gear, which is uh, prone to rusting along the uh, cut edges, the famous Siglent rust. Um, and we've got pop rivets here. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not a full aluminium uh, chassis. So yeah, that's not great, but you've got to remember that the uh, main competitor, the Rigol 815, is no different. It's exactly the same uh, sheet metal outer construction. We're going to have the aluminium block inside it for the uh, uh, RF shielding. Is it my imagination, or is there a little teensy-weensy bit of trademark siglant rust there? It's really hard to see, but yeah, there's not much. But these um, edges, if they're not treated properly, yeah, they're prone to it. You can see they do have proper RFI shielding tabs down there for the Ethernet and the USB. No worries. All right, let's pop this off. We're going to have uh, one main board, I'm sure, as is quite common. That'd be my guess with, hey, there's our shielding blocks. We've got at least two shielding blocks. Excuse me while I disconnect the power cable. There we go. I'll swing it around for you. There we go. No, we've got a separate wall. No, one main board here, separate RF board, and then another section down here. There we go. We're in like Flynn. And if we have a look at the mains input down in there, a bit hard to see, but they've got that properly uh, heat shrunk and crimped and uh, shake proof washer onto the chassis, no worries whatsoever. And the power supply looks neat and tidy, does have Siglent brand, whether or not Siglent actually designed uh, and engineered and built the thing, I don't know. They could have uh, shopped it out as, as is uh, very common in the industry. Lelon brand cap, mm, grown, you know, it's the main DC input uh, filter cap, gets less stress. We'll have to have a look at the output once there, but nice strapping over there looks nice and tidy they've uh celastic uh, down the output caps but it just looks decent design and build quality no worries i think just be able to see rubicon caps down there so yeah they're decent now this is actually significantly different to the Rigol one which had, as I mentioned, a single board uh, construction like this. This has got uh, three separate boards here and, well, I don't blame them at all. We've got our main uh, processor board down here, Spartan 6 FPGA. We'll have a look at the chips on here in more detail. Got an application processor and, you know, pretty Joe Blogs uh, stuff. And then this has a, a what probably is the uh, oscillator for the thing I would say would be over here and they're driving that but then we've got our um, our input is over here like this and then it flows through all the various stages that a spectrum analyzer needs and of course this separate block down here is going to be the tracking generator they've done that as a physically separate board and they've just got uh, the uh, you know 0.1 inch uh, IDC header cables going over here that's no problem because these aren't carrying any things significant they're carrying some power and just some, you know, control signals and things like that. So, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Inside these blocks here, you'd have some uh, power supply decoupling, local regulation and things like that. Some inductors to filter out crap and all that sort of stuff coming back in and out of these two uh, blocks here. But yeah, that's just fine and dandy. Uh, the power supply section down here, no worries. Better than the Rigol 815. If you have a look at that teardown video, you notice they had like a freestanding heat sink and it was all a bit how you're doing. This one's a bit more... Uh, polish so yeah it looks good and I think we can get right into this block here taking out the screws without taking out the board here there's a couple of longer ones which go into uh, some port support posts on the bottom there's another aluminium block on the bottom but uh, 
Let's lift it up. We've got our gold flash around the edges. Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. And yep, as I suspected, here's our oscillators. It looks like we got two of them. And these are super duper. Well, one of them's going to be super duper special because this one's pretty schmick oscillator. Much better than the... Uh, Rigol 815 that we saw in the uh, comparison video. It looks like they have a dual footprint there. So uh, let's take a look at this. All right, now we can have a look around the main board here with our Tagano microscope. We can zoom in to our heart's content. Let's uh, start away with the boring stuff. Nothing exciting around here at all unless uh, switch mode power supplies float your boat. There's a switching controller there, dead giveaway with all the uh, inductors around here and everything else. So, and then some big sort of power traces going to the inductors. Uh, that's probably a multi-channel job. Uh, what is it? 3.3 ox? Yeah, 3.3 all around there. Not much doing around here. Mikrel, good to see Mikrel. I'm a bit of a micro uh, fanboy myself and uh, yeah not a huge amount else happening everyone come on Dave show us this is the um, LCD connector going off you can tell by the uh, twisted pairs the reason they need twisters pairs is because they're high-speed serial interface and we've got ourselves a Spartan 6 XC6S LX45 um, a Spartan 6 was also used inside the uh, Rigol 815 as well I can't rem recall offhand if it was the exact same one unpopulated memory uh, footprint here they didn't need it anyway the Spartan 6 FPGA you know reasonably pedestrian uh, FPGA sort of middle of the range uh, type stuff it'd be doing all the FFT uh, processing and things like that that's what uh, FPGAs are really really good at and can't see that number very well it's all about the light by the way seeing part numbers all about the lights and the angle anyway we've got a TI part and if I shield the light from this side with my hand there it is the AM3352 that's an ARM Cortex uh, A8 processor you know the typical thing that'll run linux and uh everything else no worries it's got whiz bang 3d graphics in it and all that sort of stuff anyway i'm not fussed over those and then we got our uh looks like we have some samsung uh ddr memory here by the looks of it and there's our flash program memory we've got ourselves very nice we've got ourselves a jtag uh header up here so bingo you can uh whack that straight in probably does uh both devices i would say that might be uh daisy chaining those together because i can't see one for the is there one down is there one down here somewhere for the uh processor i don't think so this would be a test connector or something would be my guess i'd be using that for some sort of uh production system testing but uh it's interesting to note what device is missing up here u14 um, that's fascinating. It's got an external crystal, just a HC49 uh, crystal there. And, yeah, it's got a thermal pad on the bottom. Um, so it's doing something reasonably serious. I'm not sure what. Why did they leave that unpopulated? Where's Wally? I think what everyone wants to see, though, is this marvellous oscillator they got inside this thing. Oh, well, it's not marvellous. It's not like a, you know, a uh, oven-controlled oscillator or rubidium or anything fancy pantsy but you know it's a decent spec now who that is um there's our 10 that's our main 10 megahertz reference so uh yeah by all means try and decode that part number and get that who actually makes that i don't know let me google it well that doesn't uh show up anything unless i do uh some more exhaustive searching i'm afraid not much i can do there sorry about the glare but that's the only way we can get the part number on these puppies these are mccrell 5209s so i've used those before they're uh low noise low dropout regulators not bad little things so nothing else much doing discrete trenny or two no wackers, but what is U16 over here? And that one right there, bit of magic happening, bit hard to make out, but that's an analog device's ADF4001. And here's the data sheet for the ADF4001 from analog uh, devices, 200 meg clock generator PLL. But uh, look at this, it's a PLL that requires, um, for clock sources, that require very low noise, stable reference signals. It's ultra low phase noise. And that's, you know, what we're getting in this thing. I mean, it's not a industry-leading 
uh, spectrum analyzer by any stretch of the imagination, but it's uh, certainly better than the uh, Rigol. And as always, I'll link in the data sheets down below for those who want to uh, take a quick look at it. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty decent uh, PLL. I like it. And pin six here, you can see come in through the firewall here all the way over to this 40 megahertz oscillator over here so this is the pin 6 is the rf input to that so there that is coming directly from the crystal over here and of course the 10 megahertz reference will be going um, into the main uh, clock input for this thing and I really like the way that they've done this tracking generator module here. You'll notice that all these numbers, one, 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 these are the uh, long screws, which, uh, as I said for the previous board, go right down into mounts on the bottom here. And two, and two is obviously mating up with the uh, end connector on the front. And once I've taken out all these ones, actually, sorry, there we go. Taken out, oh, what's that one? No, that one's got no number. So I've taken out all that entire module pops out like that isn't that beautiful nice bit of engineering love it and you'll notice the pcb as well look gold plating on the edging castellation is like a half moon on the um you know if you do like a drill on the uh side of the thing but uh yeah that's a separate uh, manufacturing process you can get uh, most pcb manufacturers to actually do that you just need to specify that uh separately i'll have the edges gold plated thank you very much but obviously they've penalized it there's going to be a break in uh that there so maybe they uh do it oh no that's just around the connectors there oh. But anyway, that's just nice. Like a separate block like that makes it real easy to design, real easy to change the design if you had to. Like if they had to respin this, you know, they had an issue with it, they only have to respin this. They don't have to respin the, the main RF board up here, the whole, th you know, the whole shebang. They can just do the tracking generator. It's just much nicer from an engineering uh, point of view, modular based like that. Whereas the Rigol one, as we've seen in the Rigol 10 out, completely different. It's all on one board, everything. That makes it much more difficult to respin, potentially lower cost. But this one, it's going to be higher cost, uh, potentially, a little bit. You know, it's not a huge amount in it, but potentially higher cost. But yeah, it's just nicer design. Time for the reveal. Ta-da! What do we got on the top? There we go. Oh, yeah, baby, some RF magic. And on the bottom side, more. No, not as much RF magic happening there. In fact, it's just... Mm -hmm. Boring. Some passives. All the magic happens on the top. And this sort of stuff looks like RF voodoo, RF magic, but it's not. I've mentioned these in the videos before. These are just distributed element filters. They're basically LC and R filters. That's um, basically all they are. Because these elements at RF, high frequencies, uh, look like that trace there, for example, is an inductor. This big square here is a capacitor because there's going to be a ground plane on, on the layer under this uh, controlled dielectric board, by the way. This would be a, you know, some maybe a Rogers brand or something uh, controlled uh, dielectric constant. So it just has more controlled uh, frequency characteristics over, controlled impedance characteristics over the uh, wide frequency range. So this will be a capacitor directly down to ground. We'll have another inductor, another capacitor, another inductor, another capacitor capacitor, another inductor, another inductor in series with the capacitor going down to ground, an inductor, a tiny smaller inductor, much smaller than this one here in value, and then a larger capacitor is going down to ground, inductor, inductor, capacitor, inductor, blah, and so on. It's going to be a distributed element low pass filter. There's no magic in there, and a similar sort of thing is happening here as well. We've got another uh, distributed element low pass filter. Once again, we've got the uh, Micrel, they're using these everywhere, these 5209s um, for low noise uh, local voltage regulation. And uh, then we've got a few other, well, 74, <laughs> is that a 74 HC04? There you go, you've got to have some uh, 7400 series uh, TTL in there, magic. And you've got to have a classic TL072 op amp as well. But of course, it's not doing anything, uh, you know, high performance. It's just doing an offset thing or, uh, you know, something like that. So it's no big deal. It's not working at uh, frequency. It's just maybe doing some uh, uh, DC type stuff. And we've got a HMC307. This is from uh, Hittite, uh, now owned by Analog Devices. It um, looks like it's an obsolete part, but that's actually a uh, digital attenuator and 
when you go into the Siglent uh, tracking generator software and you can set the um, attenuation value of the uh, tracking generator anywhere from 1 dB. Uh, in this particular case, the chip goes from 1, 1 dB steps up to uh, 31 dB attenuation. So that's how it's doing it. Very simple. Now, of course, there's no clock on this board because the uh, tracking generator is does exactly what it says. It tracks, so it's uh, designed to take whatever the current uh, sweep frequency is as the uh, spectrum analyzer is you know sweeping across from whatever uh, your start frequency to your stop frequency then this uh, just designed to track that it generates um, uh, the same frequency as what it's uh, tracking so that's why it doesn't need its own uh, oscillator that's why the frequency um, well does it come in here or does it pop out there not entirely sure anyway which one's what which is in, which is out. Does it matter? And of course, no surprises for finding another Hittite part here, which is the uh, PLL. This is exactly what you expect in here. Um, goes up to uh, three gig, a reasonably uh, capable part there. So that would uh, that's generating the uh, the main tracking clock. You might be wondering about these. Also, I've got H in front of it. Look, 860, 835. We looked at over here. We've got an 860, and we've got a H. Uh, 976 here. These don't look like, of course, anything high frequency sort of going into them or anything like that. And, you know, lots of bypass caps around them, like zero ohm resistors, not much else. Um, what are they? They're actually linear voltage regulators. They are from um, Hittite, uh, of course, but they're, you know, specifically uh, high power supply rejection ratio uh, uh, PSRR, um, of course, uh, low dropout voltage regulators so there you go they use the specific Hittite ones which are would have been recommended possibly in the data sheet for this um, even though I haven't had a look for that you know that's probably where they came from they're specifically designed to match the other Hittite uh, chipsets and that's not uncommon um, for manufacturers of uh, specific stuff like that 74HC244 uh, and that's about all she wrote there's nothing really exciting on the other side of the board here. Geez, this um, Togato microscope handles, I mean, that board is angled at, you know, 30 degrees or something like that. Handles that really, really nicely. So you can see that whole board there. That's, <laughs> that's just brilliant. The optics on this are great. I love it. But yeah, that's all she wrote. Uh, the via stitching is just absolutely everywhere. Look, they've got a channel in here, which is the um, uh, main uh, output here. So that's, uh, that's coming from that's, we've got ourselves a driver over here. I don't know, you know, you'd have to decipher that uh, that part there. But, uh, yep, it's via stitching everywhere. And as we talked about, the uh, gold plating on the edge here before, it doesn't matter. It's not like it's going to leak out. They've got that inside as well on the different layers. So, you know, it's just fine. Oh, here we go. We actually have some silk screen to tell us what which connect is what. That's the tracking generator local oscillator, and that's the tracking generator reference input. There you go. And as is standard practice with uh, all these RF shielded enclosures, you see them all in spectrum analyzers and RF sig gens and everything. They've got the uh, machined aluminium th things with each individual building block. They, you know, each block, uh, circuit block, they actually uh, machine out a little part. So there's like, there's no leakage. And you see the gold uh, plate that makes contact with it. There's no leakage between uh, modules and channels and things like that. Fantastic. These things aren't particularly cheap, but you know, like they don't make these in millions, so they're not going to cast these. That's why you can see all the machining marks in there. They've just milled that out. And I suspect the main spectrum analyzer module here is going to come out as well. It's fantastic. I love this. I don't have to dick around with taking out the steel chassis and then, you know, dicking around with the nuts on the, you know, on the connectors and things like that, as you have to do with lots of scopes. This is just beautiful it's designed for ease of module uh replacement ease of assembly and disassembly and servicing fantastic but of course you might think mm, ease of servicing you've got all these screws on here you know like you have to to get a uh, tight seal on all of these uh, like a lot of your high-end stuff will actually use an rf gasket underneath there and uh, if you take out all the uh, screws on the real bleeding edge 
high performance ones uh, then and you disturb the gasket underneath the pressure of the gasket separating all the sections and everything else then you might have to get the thing uh, recalibration uh, checked so yeah just to make sure you know eh, eh, because the real bleeding edge RF uh, stuff it really matters this is only like a 3.2 gig one so it's eh, you know it's like baby stuff in terms of uh, RF it's you know, Real RF greybeards will probably go, ah, it's practically DC. So I've undone all the number ones here, and uh, we should, in theory. Oh, no. Oh, there's one more left here. Oh, oops. Sorry. One more left. There we go. <laughs> Dull. Okay. They should have labeled that number one as well. There we go. I think it's, whoop, it's just going to pop out as a complete module. Ah, oh, complete with, there we go, the end connector got caught, but uh, because it's got the, uh, you know, it's got the extra thread sticking out there, but look, it's just one complete block, beautiful, and once again, as I said, this is great for production testing and handling and assembly and things like that, and, you know, you don't have to, it, like, if you had one, like in the uh, Rigol, for example, uh, your assembly yield, like, you know, the bigger your board is, the, uh, uh, you know, the greater risk you take with your PCB yield, and just, you know, one part in here, for example, that didn't reflow solder properly, eh, the whole thing uh, can fail, whereas this, they can test the assembly separately and things like that. So there's lots of uh, production advantages and uh, design R&D advantages to doing it a uh, separate module like that. But that's just, that's winner, winner, chicken dinner all over. I don't have to take out the chassis, dick around with any of that stuff. Beauty. All right, here comes the big reveal. Last screw here. And unless I've forgotten one. Probably laughing at me if I have. Ta-da! Ah, oh. ah, oh. it'd be mooned. That's the back of it. And all the RF goodness. Once again, we'll see lots of distributed element filters. Once again, ta-da! Yep, there we go. Ah, oh, beautiful. Look at that. So let's take a detailed look at the main board here and uh, we're only going to be concerned with the top side here because if you have a look at the bottom side here there's just nothing of interest there it's just all uh, passives bypassing and some regulation maybe things like that so nothing special at all. Now it might look daunting at first with all these distributed element filters and everything else but as we've seen before you can see that's pretty much a modular block approach and I've done a handy little overlay here that will uh, uh, attempt to hopefully explain all the different functional blocks and the signal flow on the board so let's get to it. Now, of course, I can't guarantee this is 100% accurate. I've likely made uh, mistakes on here, and if I have, I'll endeavour to uh, correct them with overlays. So let's start by taking a look at the RF input in the top left corner. This section here, of course, contains the 50 ohm input impedance, but that uh, little SOT236 package, you'll see uh, four of these here. These are actually uh, single pole double throw switches, so they can actually switch in the uh, 50 ohm load and various other stuff. So we'll go to a higher res uh, photo for this and then zoom in on the RF section here and we can see that uh, the input is AC coupled there through uh, C10 and then that goes into U1 which is a 955C as all the other ones here, these SOT236 parts there, some form of single pole double throw switch which I can't find the data sheet for. If I can I'll link it in down below. But you can see that uh, one side of the switch there, I believe uh, pin 1 there, um, switches in um, C9 and R1. One, which is the uh, 50 ohm load there so it's not a permanent 50 ohm load input and you'll notice that there's actually four diodes unpopulated there so there's a distinct lack of input protection here so unless uh, there's something inside that little wimpy uh, U1 switch there um, th there's you know not much here at all there's basically nothing on the other side there is a tiny little diode D7 there but geez it's wimpy and if we scroll down here, we've got a couple of more of these uh, switches here. And there's some diodes, four diodes there. So I'm not exactly sure what's uh, doing there. But that looks like some uh, power supply clamping protection there. At least they start to have something now. 
And a bit further down here, you can see that uh, VR1 there, it's got 20 written on it. I'm going to assume that's a 20 dB uh, attenuator there. And you can see that's basically switching in uh, C16, that, uh, that straight uh, controlled impedance line there. So it's basically either going straight, it's selecting either straight through or a 20 dB attenuator here. Next up, we go down into a HMC. Once again, Hittite, they're everywhere. They've got the entire solution for this thing. Uh, the HMC 307, and this is the digital attenuator. So when you go into the spectrum analyzer and you set the input attenuation, you can set it in one dB steps um, up to uh, 31 dB over and above the 20 dB input attenuator. And that's exactly what this chip does. So the software is limited by the capabilities of this chip. But yeah, nice device, DC to four gig, DC to daylight. And I really like the way the designers have laid out this chip. Look at this, there's the input pin, and then there's the uh, two ground pins right there, so you can see all that uh, via stitching to separate the input and the output, so there's no uh, coupling there. And then the pin below that is the output, so from a layout point of view, it allows you to lay it out with a minimum amount of coupling. Nice. But we're not done with our input section yet. If we scroll down a little bit more, we'll see uh, the signal flow down into our next section, which is, of course, the preamp. This thing has, I believe, it's a, a 10 dB uh, preamp gain on it. So once again, selectable, so we expect to see the digital switches there, and that's exactly what we get. So I can either bypass the uh, preamp or switch in the preamp. But of course, in this case, you'll notice that the switches are bigger. They're a different package, and we can actually get the data sheet. Surprise, surprise, it's another Hittite uh, part, a single pole double throw. Uh, it's a non-reflective switch up DC to not quite daylight this time, 3.5 gig. Uh, it's a non-reflective switch. You can see the internal diagram there. It's actually got internal 50 ohm uh, termination resistors in there. But uh, basically, it's just a switch. It allows us, to, so they use a combination of two of them. You can switch in your preamp or switch it out. Easy. Now that's all bread and butter stuff, but look at all these other blocks in here, and this is the complex operation of a spectrum analyzer. Not all spectrum analyzers operate the same, uh, but they use very similar uh, techniques. So what we're going to do is take a look at a basic uh, block diagram here, so we've looked at basically just one block here, the RF input attenuator in near the signal input there, and that includes the switching and the preamp and everything else. Now we expect to see a low pass filter in here, and that's what we'll see in a second. And then that goes into a mixer, which then uh, uses a local oscillator, mixes the two signals together, generates a higher frequency called the intermediate frequency. And then we expect to see a gain stage there. There's that gray uh, uh, amplifier block there. Uh, attenuator, we won't see this in this one, but it doesn't matter. Um, that IF then goes into an IF filter, we'll definitely see that, and then it goes into a log amp, and envelope detector, video filter, and display, but that's not quite how this one works. We need to look at another block diagram for that. And as it says here, most spectrum analyzers use two or four mixing steps to reach the final intermediate uh, frequency that we can then, uh, in this case, or do all digital processing and actually display that, because this is an all digital IF system instead of a traditional uh, analog spectrum analyzer. Anyway, so there's go we're gonna see several steps here. By the way, these diagrams come from the uh, Keysight uh, application note AN150. I'll link it in down below. Highly recommend, it's one of the best reads on uh, how spectrum analyzers work and everything else. So we expect to see, uh, uh, in well in this case what we're going to see is two local oscillators. The first one goes into the first mixer uh, and then the second one that goes into the second mixer here. If we take a look at the first mixer on the left hand side there, that's the green circle with the X there, we need this because we need to generate a higher frequency than our uh, frequency range of interest. In this case, our spectrum analyzer can go up to 3.2 gig. So we have to generate an intermediate frequency higher than that because if we don't do that, then there will be uh, dead bands within the measurement window that just won't work. So we have to actually mix that with a high, mix our input frequency with a higher frequency to generate an intermediate frequency above our maximum 3.2 gig input range. 
And if we go back to our original block diagram here, what we expect after our input stuff is a low pass filter and then a mixer with a local oscillator feeding into that mixer. Do we get that? Well, let's take a look. Yes, of course we do. You can see the uh, preamp there on the left that we looked at before. It then feeds into a down into that uh, low pass filter, which is again a distributed element uh, filter there with the various L's and C's. And then that goes into a mixer IC there, which then uh, accepts the signal from above it there from that uh, nice looking uh, bow tie distributed element low pass filter and that will come from the local oscillator as we'll see but it's a bit more complex it's not like the local oscillator feeds straight in we're doing some tricks with our local oscillator in this particular case but anyway the output from the mixer then goes into that uh, amplifier gain stage as we saw on the block diagram and if we take a look at a high-res photo of the mixer and that uh, amplifier, IF amplifier uh, stage, once again, we've got two Hittite parts yet again. The uh, HMC488 mixer there on the left and the HMC716 uh, amplifier. Let's take a look at the data sheets. And this mixer can go from 4 to 7 gig, which is exactly what we want. It's above our operational uh, frequency range of our amplifier. And if we have a look at uh, the specs here, then our uh, intermediate uh, frequency range, DC to 2.5 gig. And then our IF amplifier chip, the HMC716, it's exactly what you expect. It's a, in this case, it's an 18 dB gain uh, amplifier, but it's got uh, the bandwidth of 3.1 to 3.9 gig. So it's designed to operate within that range, which is above basically our 3.2 gig maximum operational frequency range. And that's where our IF frequency is gonna sit somewhere above 3.2 gig. The exact value, uh, we don't actually know unless we do more investigation or some measurements. But before we follow that intermediate frequency out, we want to see our local oscillator. Because I said before, it wasn't as simple as just the local oscillator feeding into the mixer as it shows on the uh, block diagrams for spectrum analyzers. So if we zoom in here, we can find our uh, first local oscillator, our main uh, voltage controlled oscillator. And this one uses a ZCOM uh, part there for the VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator, and which is the big metal can there, and another Hittite uh, PLL there to form our local oscillator. Now this is made by a company called Z Communications and they make a ton of different variants of these with different ranges and things like that. And this one is going to cover the frequency range that we need. If you have a look at the uh, tuning voltage here, it goes from 1800 to 4200 megahertz or uh, 1.8 to 4.2 gig. And pretty much exactly the range we need here. And this is our sweep generator we saw in the block diagram on the bottom left there. The red sweep generator feeds into the local oscillator and then feeds into the mixer. But as I said, there's a few more steps after our local oscillator before we get to the mixer in this particular analyzer. But as part of that local oscillator, we've got a Hittite HMC703 uh, fractional synthesizer, which forms part of the ultimate uh, PLL local oscillator loop. And we can see that here, if we take a look at the uh, demo board you can actually get for this chip, it shows that there's a VCO integrated as part of the system here, in this case a Hittite HMC508, but in the case of the uh, Cyclant Spectrum Analyzer here, we're using a VCO from uh, Z Communications. And if you believe the sales blurb here, check it out. This platform has the best phase noise and spurious performance in the industry. Yes, thank you very much. But once again, you know, decent choices being made here to enable a pretty decent performance at a low price point. Well done, Siglant. But even with all that magic, the output of the first main local oscillator here is not high enough in frequency. So it goes into a frequency doubler there, and uh, this is designed for a two, two to four gig input, so doubles that anywhere from uh, four up to eight gig. But once again, the exact bandwidth uh, frequency range we're talking about here, we don't exactly know unless we did further investigations or measurement. And the frequency doubler being used again, a Hittite HMC189 here, 2 to 4 gig input as I said, so 4 to 8 gig output, eh, it's designed for exactly this job. And this particular part isn't obsolete, unlike uh, if you were very keen, you would have noticed uh, plastering over the data sheets for a couple of chips before, we would have seen that they're actually obsolete. So yeah, why they're still using them, I don't know, maybe there's nothing better at the price point.
But we're not done yet. No sorry, Bob. The output of the frequency doubler here for our local oscillator uh, goes into uh, two single pole double throw switches, which then can select one of three bandpass filters. In this case, uh, th this particular uh, physical arrangement, the distributed element uh, filter, is called an interdigital uh, bandpass filter. And so three different frequencies. You can actually see that they're different uh, geometries there, which actually selects the bandwidth and the response and then there's three uh, single pole double throw switches on the other side so the software can select one of three bandpass filters on our local oscillator. And these switches are different to what we've seen before. These are uh, VSWA 2-63, blah, 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 blah. And these are uh, high isolation absorptive uh, single pole double throw switches with integrated CMOS drivers and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. And we don't care about the quiescent current really. Um, and 500, uh, to six, 500 meg to 6 gig uh, bandwidth. Pretty decent. And we're almost there. I've mentioned this before. You can see the output of that um, one, that selectable bandpass filter there. Then uh, goes through just a little bit more stuff there and goes through another uh, bow tie low pass filter. It's called a bow tie low pass filter because it looks like a bow tie. That's where it gets its uh, name from. Another low pass filter um, just takes the edge off something or other. And then that finally goes into the mixer. So that block diagram we saw before and you see for all spectrum analyzers, the local oscillator goes straight into the mixer. Well, yes, you've seen. It's a bit more complicated than that for various uh, performance reasons. But if you're keen eye, you wouldn't notice something in between there. The output uh, from the interdigital filter after the uh, switching and uh, probably some little uh, buffering there or something uh, then goes into this odd looking uh, arrangement here on the board, which is coupling um, the signal to go over. If you follow the trace on the other side, it's coupling over to go up to the tracking generator local oscillator SMA connector and that jumps on over to the uh, tracking generator module we saw before. So finally out of our mixer and then through our IF gain stage which we've looked at uh, we expect to find an IF filter and well you betcha look at the output of the, amp the 18 dB uh, IF amplifier down here bingo it goes into another bandpass filter another interdigital uh, type once again a different geometry in there uh, to give you a different uh, range and uh, response of the thing and then that's followed by another uh, cute looking bow tie uh, low pass filter as well once again just to take the upper edge off uh, something and if you're curious about how these interdigital uh, bandpass filters actually work when you can clearly see that both uh, like the input signal comes in and then it basically goes down to ground with a trace sticking up and then the other then the trace on the right hand side next to that uh, goes up to ground at the top side and then the next one goes down to uh, ground. So how does this actually work? Well it's because we're at high frequencies here. These work at you know several hundred megahertz up to you know several gigahertz or something like that. They're basically uh, coupled resonators but they're also known as interdigitated cards coupled resonators. So yeah, they resonate between the two and then it propagates along and resonates. And that's why you might see different spacing in there is to give a different passband characteristic for this thing. Anyway, you have to get into real complex RF microstrip type theory to, you know, figure out exactly how this works. And there's a ton of math into it. And I'm sure you could Google it if you're really interested. But yeah, even though it goes down the ground there, it gets through. But we said here before that uh, this particular spectrum analyzer arrangement uses uh, two mixing uh, techniques. And so we need to find that second mixer and the second local oscillator as well. And if we pan across here, bingo, the output of our filter there goes into another mixer, uh, the 488, uh, exactly as we had before. But just like on the block diagram here, you'll notice that the output of the second mixer is a much lower frequency. It's within, way under, way within uh, the passband of our spectrum analyzer in this block diagram, 322 megahertz. But in the case of uh, this particular one here, it's actually at 810 megahertz. And the reason we know that is because, hey, look, we can look at the um, uh, filters on the output of the mixer and we can see that there are 
uh, saw filters or surface acoustic wave filters and we can have a look at the data sheet for this particular uh, one. They're available in all different frequencies. This one happens to be an 810 megahertz saw filter. So we know that's the output uh, frequency of the second mixer. But this isn't low enough uh, frequency for now us to do digital IF uh, sampling on. So what we want to do is feed it into another third mixer, just like what's uh, shown here, to actually down convert it to a frequency that we, a baseband frequency that we can actually sample with like a Joe Bloggs, uh, you know, 16 bit analog to digital converter. And we can see that here, the output of the saw filter goes into this little white block here, which is a mini circuits. Yes, we finally get a mini circuits win in the design here. It's not all Hittite. Min mini circuits, one of the biggest uh, providers of uh, these sorts of uh, mixes. And so this will go in and we can take a look at the data sheet for this mini circuits mixer as well. But there's nothing terribly exciting to see here. It's just a, you know, basically five megahertz to one gig mixer designed for this sort of uh, application uh, down conversion uh, to a baseband signal. But wait, we're not finished with the mixer. Every mixer's got to have a local oscillator input. Where's that coming from? Well, it, it is coming from the second local oscillator, but we need a much lower frequency. So you'll notice that the second local oscillator here, uh, as like feeding the second mixer across to the left there, it also goes up and that same signal feeds a uh, is divided by four and then that gets fed into the third mixer, which does the down conversion. So we've got our final RF uh, frequency bandwidth here, and this goes into, uh, curiously, a single pole four throw switch, and that's what the IC is. So I'm not exactly sure what it's selecting there. You know, there's some sort of different uh, filtering options that it's doing there. I'm not exactly sure what. Anyway, that then goes over into another single pole four throw switch here, which has only half the stuff populated. So that's quite unusual. Why did they leave that out? Now, as a user by the name of uh, Gozu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly on the EEV blog forum, uh, postulated for this one, um, it, it, I, it certainly looks like another bandpass uh, filter in there uh, with the inductors and the caps in there. And uh, that would be one of going into, presumably, one of the channels of U85 on the left-hand side there, the uh, single pole four throw switch. And presumably, there would be a software option for this to have another additional bandpass filter on the final IF before it uh, goes into the sampler. So maybe there's even a secret menu option for it if you could hack the firmware or whatever, or maybe you know they had an early version of uh, firmware that decided they didn't want it. I don't know, it could still be there. Who knows, could be interesting, but yeah, I don't know. If you could find it, you might be able to hack in your own uh, bandpass filter in there for some additional functionality. And the good thing about an experiment or hack like that is that you're not really, you know, damaging anything. You're populating existing footprints in there with an existing digital switch that's only affected if you enable a software option in the firmware to actually flick that switch and, in, you know, put that uh, filter in series with the final IF there. So, you know, you can play around if your heart's content without really risking uh, damaging anything. So that's it, we're finally through our complete block diagram here, but this envelope detector, wah, we don't have that, because as I said before, this uh, spectrum analyzer uses what's called an all digital IF filter. So it does everything after the IF stage, the intermediate frequency stage, it just samples that directly with a high resolution, uh, high sample rate analog to digital converter, and then does everything in software. As we see in this uh, Keysight application uh, note here, here is how uh, the Keysight X series signal analyzers do uh, an all digital IF. They've got an ADC in there with the gain and the alias filter, everything else, but it goes into then a custom IC, which in this case would be that uh, Spartan 6 FPGA we saw is doing a Hilbert transform and then it's doing some filtering and then it can do the video bandwidth in there and does logs and powers and all sorts of and uh, the detector all sorts of stuff all with inside uh, that'd be happening inside that Spartan 6 FPGA no doubt and then that goes into the pro and probably it'll be doing the FFT in there as well um, and then that just goes out to the display applications processor which we saw earlier.
So now we have to go full circle right back to the main PCB under that uh, block where we found our main reference oscillator before. And what do we find? Surprise, surprise, an ADC driver designed specifically for IF baseband processing. In this case, it's the uh, National Semiconductor, none of this Texas Instruments rubbish, LMH6517. It's designed exactly for this, for a 16-bit ADC. And there's the block diagram down the bottom. So no surprises to find what's down below this. I'll give you one guess. And congratulations, you win a Brass Razoo. It's an analog to digital converter. It's the analog devices uh, AD9235. Actually, 12 bit. Surprise, surprise. Not this 16 bit rubbish, I guess. For Siglent, no, 12 bit will do the job just fine. And uh, yeah, it's designed for ultrasound equipment. <gasps> oh, low cost digital oscilloscopes. There we go. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. And you'll notice that we've got the uh, dash 40 part there, uh, which means 40 meg samples per second. This part's available from 20 up to 65 meg samples per second. So at 40 meg samples per second, we know that our uh, IF baseband frequency has to be somewhere below 20 because, you know, all that Nyquist stuff, really annoying. Yeah, so it's got to be at most half of that sample rate. So there you go, that's a rather lengthy look inside the brand spanking new Siglent SSA3021 Spectrum Analyzer. I hope you enjoyed that. I sort of went uh, to town a bit actually uh, going through the various uh, sections on here. I hope you found that uh, rather interesting. And as always, if you want to discuss this, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. Links down below. That's where everyone's trying going to try and discuss the pros and cons of this thing. But hey... You know, I could not fault this. There's no bodges in the thing. There's no crap quality parts in the thing. And they've you know, designed and engineered the RF part of it really, really well. So the design and engineering that went into the RF section, which is uh, much more capable and more complicated than the uh, Rigol one, they've really, I think, they've gone to town on it. And Siglent should be uh, pretty proud about this effort for their first ever uh, Spectrum Analyzer. So well done, Siglent. Big thumbs up there. So if you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up and links down below, all that sort of jazz. As always, catch you next time. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to rush to get this video out. It's been kicking my backside and I don't have time today to put it back together. I gotta quickly finish this edit and get out of here. So yeah, trust me, it'll work. She'll be right, no worries. Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday with another Spectrum Analyzer, the Rigol DSA 815TG with the optional tracking generator. Thought we'd crack it open, take a look inside because spectrum analyzers are usually a bit more interesting than other bits of test gear like your run on the mill scope or your multimeter or whatever. A bit more engineering poured in these things. So, you know what we say here on the EEV blog don't turn it on, take it apart.